it's an incredible privilege to be able to do this for a living um, because the opportunity to change laws, save lives, um, it's, it, it's like very few other things in that regard and to really touch people's daily lives and help them in the way that we can. And so, you know, I want people who are going to really want to seize on that opportunity and who don't just look at it as this is a job. Questions about what what online has meant to the Seattle Times, how how that move has been made. Mm -hmm. You said that you have you know, dozens of Twitter feeds that you, you sort of or yeah, Twitter feeds that you don't right. see, and uh, you include Pinterest on there, which isn't you know always included on uh, right. this social media. Well, I, I would take you through some history of it, I think, to explain best how we approach it these days. Um, like most newspapers, you know, in the early 90s, we created a web page. I can't tell you exactly when that was, but I, I think it was a, just about 20 years ago. Um, and for the first 10 years, really, of SeattleTimes.com, um, it was mostly just the content from the printed newspaper, um, published once a day, usually at midnight. I, I always thought of it as sort of, you know, we, we were working towards this evening deadline and then we just sort of threw the, the content over a wall and some other people um, posted it. And the page, uh, the website was, was pretty static. And, um, you know, if there was very big breaking news during the day, we'd update it, but for the most part, it was, it was very one-dimensional, flat, and, and basically the printed newspaper put online without some of the strengths of print um, in terms of design and serendipity and so on. Um, I took over the responsibility for our online operation in 2006 and immediately set out to, to change that. And our philosophy has very much been um, to integrate our news operation um, so that everybody is thinking um, beyond print and to all the different ways we distribute news and information, but then to separate out by platform how we're actually doing that. So a lot of editors in my position talk a lot about, um, they use the term platform agnostic. We reject that totally. Um, I think that's a really wrong-headed approach. We try to, to be platform specific and really think about what, um, what are the, the core qualities and competencies of each platform and, and how do we tailor to those platforms. So if you're thinking, and, and what we want is we want our readers, we want to maximize the number of people who are using us in all the, as many forms as possible. So we like to think of the ideal customer as somebody who gets up in the morning, goes and, and gets their, their printed paper off the doorstep, you know, spends some time with that, puts it aside to come back to probably later on, or takes a section to work with them, um, looks at their phone before they go to work, and, and looking at, at the traffic and weather on Seattle, to, on, on our uh, phone app, um, drives to work, gets on their computer at work and sort of looks at, all right, what, what else is going on? What's the latest? Um, begins to interact with the news, comments, um, go, goes uh, to the things that are more about engagement, not just reading. Um, comes back at noon, maybe goes through some photo galleries and some sports stuff that maybe has been updated. Um, looks again before they go home as to traffic and weather, maybe on their phone or on the website gets home, um, maybe at that point they pick up their, or they eat dinner and then they look at their iPad, which is actually when people look at it most, we found between 7 and 10 p.m. And that's more sort of a lean back experience like the printed paper, going through and looking uh, at things they may have missed during the day uh, from the paper or from online and, and looking forward to the next day. So we, we really are trying to think of the outlets that way. In the meantime, I didn't mention, you know, during the day, whether it's on their desktop or laptop or on their phone or on their tablet, being sort of being in the Twitter stream with us in terms of things that are, are breaking during the day. Okay. Um, so you said you, you took over the online stuff in 2006. 
Um, what role were you in when, when you took over? I had, I had, we had been organized. Uh, uh, we had a print operation and a very separate and much, much smaller online operation. And there, I was the managing editor for print, and we had another managing editor for online and a different executive editor. Um, I took it over when I became the executive editor. And then I, um, over the past few years, have sort of blown up that structure and we've reorganized in the, in the last year, year and a half, to have a different sort of structure where we have, uh, we still have two managing editors, but one is uh, primarily over the creation of content um, for whatever format. Um, one is over what we call the curation of, com of content, so really thinking about presentation. So that first group is reporters, photographers, videographers, um, uh, the, the editors, the assigning editors, the people who are really focused on creating content. The second group is more focused on um, the presentation of content, standards, editing, um, and, and the digital uh, producers are in that group along with people who are designing for print and editing for print. And then we have a third very small group, but it, it's, more of a, it's more of a theme in the newsroom, which is around community. And these are people who are focused on social media, but also on bringing people into the newsroom to interact with us and educate us, um, events that we have outside the newsroom. Um, and all of that, so those are three intersecting circles, and in the middle of all that is um, the, the most important thing that we're focused on, which is engagement, you know, really getting people to engage with us, with our content, uh, and with each other. Okay. Uh, when, when you did sort of change the model of how you guys were operating with two sort of separate newsrooms, did you find some, you know, some tension or some shortfalls when you combined them? Say people who are old school who didn't think that they should be you know, working on this platform or vice versa? Yeah, I mean, for years, and, and we still have a little bit of it, but very, very little. But for years, yeah, we had people who had been here a long time who thought that posting our content um, online for free was crazy. And as it turns out, you know, they had a point, <laughs> I think. Um, you know, I think all newspapers now look back and say, yeah, maybe we shouldn't have made it free at the beginning. But um, yeah, there, there, are, there are a lot of people who have a really hard time breaking out of that cycle of, okay, we write, we report all day, we write for an evening deadline for the next morning, and that, that's our rhythm. Um, one advantage we have in that regard is for most of the Seattle Times history, f in fact, for we're 116 years old this month, and for about 104 of those years, we were an afternoon paper. So people, you know, a lot of us do know that rhythm of, of being live during the day, and so that was an advantage. But yeah, there's no doubt we had a lot of cultural um, conflict and, and a lot of challenge to get people to, to change their perspective and their rhythm. And, and it's still, even for the ones who get it most, it's, it's hard because if you're expected to be tweeting and updating and you're focused on that all day long, sometimes it's really hard to, to be giving the time to reporting. Um, that's one reason we had, we changed the structure so that the creation people could really be thinking primarily about getting out of the office and gathering information and focused outwardly instead of on this pipeline and on the technology. Uh, so speaking of the difference between sort of curation and creation, uh, do you think that's giving you guys sort of a leg up in, in how you package your, your stories for different applications or different, different platforms? I think it will. I don't think it has yet. Um, this is still a pretty uh, nation idea and, and we haven't perfected it yet and we have some special obstacles that are around um, labor uh, labor relations so we, we're a union represented newsroom through most of the newsroom um, except for management people and the people who work exclusively in the digital space they're not union so the union people can work in the digital space but the non-union digital people cannot work for print, and so that 
we have some inefficiencies in there that we have to work on and, and work through. Um, and then from a technical standpoint, um, we're resource challenged and we haven't really developed um, the, the design and the, the full use of, of the applications, particularly for the tablet and the phone the way we want them to be, but we're working on that. Um, I have been in, let's see, I started in newspapers 33 years ago. Started a little paper, Anacortes, uh, Anacortes American, where I was the only reporter and covered just about everything, wrote the weddings, did everything. And then a little daily in Mount Vernon after that. Um, Tacoma for two years while I also got a graduate degree at the University of Washington. And I've been at the Seattle Times for 29 years. Um, do you miss print being the sort of prevalent way that people were doing the news? Or do you think it's just different, maybe not good or bad, just different? Um, I, I, I wouldn't say I miss it. I mean, I say to a lot of people, it's, it's certainly the most challenging time in our business. Um, but that's not so much because of readership. And in fact, there are more people reading Seattle Times content today than ever in our history, if you consider print, online, and all the different tools. And, and we still sell a lot of newspapers. There are still more than a million people who read our Sunday newspaper every Sunday. Um, so it, but you know, we have major business model challenges because that was all an advertising model that's really sort of turned on its head in a lot of ways. Um, it's the most challenging time, but it's also the most exciting. And the, the notion of being able to touch people in all these different ways and to hear back from them in ways that we never could before, I, 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 I dig it, I think it's fun. Um, that sort of works into my next question, which is, you know, in 2010, you guys got a, a Pulitzer um, for your coverage of uh, the police shootings. Um, do you think that, maybe not, obviously not the way you covered it, but the, the amount of coverage you were able to get it would have been possible, say, 20 or 30 years ago yeah. before online was developed? No, there's no question about it. And in fact, um, for most of our history, um, the Seattle Times w was known in town jokingly as Fairview Fanny, and um, part of that was uh, we, we definitely had a reputation as sort of s very uh, slow-moving, thoughtful. I mean, it's always been a paper that, that had a, a great heritage of enterprise and investigative reporting, especially the past couple of decades, but, um, but not, very, uh, not very quick uh, on our feet. And in the past few years, because of digital, we've really had to develop those uh, quick twitch, fast breaking news muscles. And having all these digital tools to do so, it's really helped. And it's, and it's funny, we have gone from a paper that frankly was not good at breaking news to one that today, if you were to ask journalists around the country, they would say we're one of the best papers in the country at breaking news. So we won that Pulitzer in 2010. And then in 2012, we won the Pulitzer for investigative reporting, sort of the other end of the spectrum. And in my mind, those are the two things we have to be great at to be successful going forward in this century. So I, I'm feeling really good about that. Uh, uh, when you look for, for people to come work at the Seattle Times, what sort of skills are you looking for? Are you looking for people who are strong writers but not photographers, decent writers, decent photographers? I mean, what sort of skills do you want uh, a new journalist to have? Yeah, I mean, I think it's good. One of the things that's, that I think is really um, a positive thing in journalism education right now is that people in, in most schools are learning a range of skills. And you, um, from most places, you can't come out and just know writing and reporting, or just know photography, photography, you need to know the range. But frankly, the way it manifests at a paper of this size, most people are only doing um, one or two things. They're not doing everything. Um, it just helps to understand everything and makes you a more, more effective teammate to understand what the challenges are. So what I look for more than anything, way more than any particular skill set on a piece of equipment, um, is a way of thinking. And uh, what I'm looking for is, is curiosity. Curiosity, drive. Um, this is a real, it's an incredible privilege to be able to do this for a living um, because the opportunity to 
change laws, save lives. Um, it's, it, it's like very few other things in that regard, and to really touch people's daily lives and help them in the way that we can. And so, you know, I want people who are going to really want to seize on that opportunity and who don't just look at it as this is a job. Um, I very much look at it. For me, this was a calling. And for most of the people I've hired over the years, um, the reason I've hired them, is it very clearly is a calling for them. So I'm looking for curiosity. The, the most important, when I interview somebody, the most important question in that interview is the one they ask me, not anything I ask them. And when I say, do you have any questions for me? And if they say, no, not really, I'm not going to hire them. Because <laughs> you know, if you're a journalist and you don't have a question for me, you know, then you're probably not what we're looking for. Yeah. Uh, so besides that sort of curiosity and, and trying to you know, breed that, what sort of advice would you give you know, young people who might be interested in going into journalism or, or at least you know, staying with that path of take? I, absolutely the, the most important um, skill set to learn is how to find out information that powerful people and institutions don't want you to know. That to me is, is far and away the most important skill set. And so that means learning how to work with data, learning how to work with documents, learning interv interview techniques. Um, writing and expression obviously is a very close second. You have to be able to express all that. But you know, I, given the choice, I'd much rather have a great reporter who's a mediocre writer than the other way around. And unfortunately, in this day and age, um, I think it, people are so free with their thoughts and opinions about everything. <laughs> and almost everybody considers themselves a journalist at some, at some level, that that stuff's cheap. What isn't cheap is really good, solid, verified, validated, uh, uncovered information. So that, those are the most important skills. Um, you actually mentioned something that reminded me of another question I was thinking on the way here, if you don't mind. Um, with, with you know, so many neighborhood blogs, especially here in Seattle, do you see them as sort of competing with the Seattle Times or supplementing Seattle Times? I mean, how, how do you see them related to the organization? Yeah, we, we've taken an approach that I'm actually very proud of and that's really unusual around the country. Um, once this once they started to emerge in this ecosystem and it started to change, this is a level of coverage that we never did. It's not like people talking about, well, the blogs emerged to fill the void of the PI going away or whatever. No, the PI never did neighborhood coverage to any great extent, and neither did we. Um, so having these neighborhoods covered, and, and because you now you're able to do that with the technology, I think it's great. And so the approach we've taken is to embrace them, and that it really does um, enhance what we do. We want to be the center of that ecosystem, um, the, you know, the sort of the biggest, baddest organism in it. <laughs> but having all these others out there that we, the quality ones that we can uh, work with, we love that. So we have about, we started with five, two years ago with five um, community blog partners. We now have more than 50. And we feature them on our homepage and we take people right to their content and, and we find that people come back to us. I think it's great. All right, um, just one more question. Um, do you have any advice, maybe not necessarily geared towards you know young starting out journalists, but just any advice, big wisdom or small wisdom that you've gained over your your you know, decades of experience? I, I think that the most important advice I would give is, and and I, I, frankly, it's something I have to remind myself of with regularity is. The ability to do this is such a privilege, and, and even at a time, especially at a time like this where there's so much turmoil and fear and, and anxiety about how the business is going to work in, in our industry, um, to not waste a day. You know, that, that every day when you have the, the um, opportunity to do this, there are so many ways that our society and people's lives can be improved, and we have. Um, such a unique ability to be able to do that that I think seizing the day is, is just crucial.